and welcome to our service of morning prayer. Uh, St. Valentine's Day and we're also uh, focusing our thoughts around the uh, transfiguration of our Lord. Uh, Anne's not with me uh, today. Some of you expressed a little concern that she wasn't with me last time either and that was because somebody had just telephoned us uh, as we were about to record and I like to stay uh, to a reasonably strict schedule uh, and at the time it took me to uh, do the service the phone call was still ongoing uh, we're waiting for a phone call an important phone call at the moment um, we had to make a choice uh, do we miss the phone call or do we go ahead just me on my own uh, she'll be with us for Ash Wednesday there'll be a service uh, going out on Ash Wednesday that's the 17th of this month it's fairly early uh, this year relatively early uh, and that's this incoming Wednesday. The service will go out at 7.30. And it will go out as a live stream as it were. It will be pre-recorded. But it will go out in real time. And I invite you to sit down at 7.30. To participate in that act of worship uh, for Ash Wednesday. Uh, the joy of it being on uh, YouTube is that you can of course go back and watch it later on so if you're out milking or uh, at work or, or whatever it may be well that's the time to put the baby to bed that's okay you can watch it later on but what we're trying to do is at the very least give a sense of us all being at worship at the same time so if you can on wednesday evening at 7 30 sit down with your family uh, or if you're on your own just sit down uh, with your cup of tea your dog on your knee uh, stroke the cat while you say your prayers and as we move into Lent through Wednesday. So uh, I just thought I'd make that announcement at the beginning of our worship today. So the service of morning prayer uh, on page 101 of the Church of Ireland prayer book. The Lord be with you. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Beloved in Christ, we come together to offer to Almighty God our worship and praise and thanksgiving, to confess our sins and to receive God's forgiveness, to hear his holy word proclaimed, to bring before him our needs and the needs of the world, and to pray that in the power of his Spirit we may serve him and know the greatness of his love. Let us confess our sins to God our Father. Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do, we are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth will proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. O come, let us sing out to the Lord. Let us shout in triumph to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his face with thanksgiving and cry out to him joyfully in psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his and he made it and his hands moulded dry land. Come let us worship and bow down and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is the Lord our God. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Today if only you would hear his voice. 
Do not harden your hearts as you did in the wilderness, when your forebears tested me, put me to the proof, though they had seen my works. Forty years long I loathed that generation and said, It is a people who err in their hearts, for they do not know my ways, of whom I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. And the psalm appointed for today is Psalm 50, verses 1 to 6. The Lord, the most mighty God, has spoken, and called the world from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, perfect in beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and will not keep silence. Consuming fire goes out before him, and mighty tempest stirs about him. He calls the heaven above and the earth that they may judge his people. Gather to me my faithful, who have sealed my covenant with sacrifice. Let the heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Glory. To the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Our first reading is from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 4, beginning to read at verse 3. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We praise you, O God, we acclaim you as the Lord. All creation worships you, the Father everlasting. To you, all angels, all the powers of heaven, the cherubim and seraphim sing in endless praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. The glorious company of apostles praise you. The noble fellowship of prophets praise you. The white-robed army of martyrs praise you. Throughout the world, the Holy Church acclaims you. Father of majesty unbounded, your true and only Son, worthy of all praise, the Holy Spirit, advocate and guide. Our second reading is our Gospel reading, which is from Mark chapter 9, reading from verse 2. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son the Beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them any more, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The mountain of transfiguration, and it says, And Jesus 
he was transfigured before them. And you may say to yourself, well, what does it mean he was transfigured before them? And the text tells us what it means. And his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And we're told in the other accounts that his face also radiated. Something extraordinary has happened. The glory of the Lord is revealed. And there are a number of aspects of this revelation uh, before us today. Jesus is revealed in the state of sinlessness that he truly is. So what we see here is man perfected or the perfect man. What you and I would be like if we were without sin. If we were without that bias in our lives to disobedience. That bias in our lives that would uh, lead us to do uh, the wrong thing. Or to be negligent of doing the right thing. So we have before us uh, this revelation of perfected humanity. We also have, of course, uh, the, the clear vision given to uh, the disciples of what the incarnation means of God in flesh. So uh, we have the revelation here also of Jesus in his full nature before them, the divine uh, the man who is God, the God who is man, uh, revealed on this mountain. And he is filled with glory. And uh, St. Paul reflects this in what he has written, uh, that uh, we see, uh, seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. We're told elsewhere that he is the very radiance of God's glory. I love that phrase and you're probably familiar with me quoting it. It's from Hebrews chapter 1. He's the very radiance of God's glory. And God's glory radiates through Jesus. And he is revealed to them. So they see uh, what it is to be without sin. Really revealed before them. And they see what it is to be God in flesh. Really revealed before them. There's a further context here in those who are revealed who appear with him, Elijah and Moses. And Elijah and Moses are very significant characters uh, in the theology, psychology and mindset of, of uh, Jewish worshippers. Uh, and they would not have been lost on these Jewish men with Jesus. Elijah is a very enigmatic character who appears but briefly uh, in the Old Testament. Just for a handful of chapters we have this extraordinarily dynamic ministry of a man who comes in out of nowhere and then departs to heaven as it were. And uh, not an awful lot of else said about him. For example we know the prophet Amos was a shepherd. Uh, we know what he did and who he was. We we know uh, who Jeremiah was. We know who Isaiah was. We know who Samuel was and how Samuel uh, from before his birth was committed by his mother into the service of Almighty God and from the earliest childhood uh, reflected God's ministry in all that he was about and who he is. Um, so we have... Uh, Elijah comes along, strangely not uh, in the reading of the books of the Old Testament, he doesn't appear to be the most significant person. It's a bit like the character Melchizedek in the book of Genesis. Melchizedek appears but briefly in the book of Genesis, a priest and a prophet who lives in Jerusalem and as Abraham and his Tribes and flocks and a host uh, are passing through uh, Judea. Uh, Melchizedek comes out of uh, Jerusalem and blesses Abraham and then goes back into Jerusalem. And we might think, well, there you go. There you are now. There's a, a, a narrative. And then we go to the book of Hebrews in the New Testament and a whole theology 
a whole Christology, a whole idea about God and Christ and his ministry and his work is woven around this man Melchizedek. Who was he? This mysterious person. And it's the same with Elijah. There's not a whole lot, there's the saying for manna, there's not a whole heap written about him in the Old Testament. And yet he's here. Yet he's here in this moment. He's significant in the prophecies about the coming Messiah that Elijah will be revealed at the time of the Messiah. At the, the, the Seder meal at the uh, Passover, when Jews gathered and yet gathered today, uh, they are expectant of the coming Messiah. And the Orthodox practice is to leave an empty chair and the door open should Elijah come and join them for the prophecy says before the coming of uh, Messiah the prophet Elijah will appear and we have the whole Elijah imagery around the life work and ministry of John the Baptist as well so Elijah's here he's also emblematic and, uh, and a symbol of the prophets just as Moses is the symbol of the law you know how we use that phrase in our liturgy and in our, our talking and teaching, the law and the prophets. And here we have the law and the prophets. Moses, uh, that massive figure, by complete contrast to Elijah. Uh, the first five books, although he didn't pen every uh, letter of the first five, five books, first five books of the Bible are known by the time of Jesus and even in our time as the books of Moses books of the law, the one to whom uh, the laws were given, uh, not just the Ten Commandments, but the amplified and detailed laws uh, are given through Moses. Moses the Deliverer. Uh, Moses who uh, is a, a type, to use an old-fashioned theological term, a type of Christ. Uh, uh, and Jesus is always the anti-type, but he is the type. And uh, he is the one who delivers them from bondage into promise. And he's this enormous figure. And despite the fact there's little written about Elijah, he's this enormous figure in the thinking of the Jews. And it is he who represents in this visionary moment the law and the prophets. So there they are. And they're talking with Jesus. It's a very uh, strange occurrence. Uh, a very unusual occurrence, a very overwhelming occurrence. Can you imagine how you would have responded had you been there? And Peter speaks on behalf of the other two. Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings for you. One for Moses and one for Elijah and one for you. Um, he did not know what to say. For they were terrified. Yeah, I think I would have been too. I think I would have been overwhelmed. And then once again we have that old hymn comes to mind. I stand amazed at the glory of Jesus the Nazarene. I stand amazed at the glory of Jesus the transfigured one. Really, really uh, amazing moment. For the rest of the time, although they see Jesus uh, command evil spirits. Although they see Jesus break bread and multiply it for uh, the feeding of thousands. Although they see Jesus raise the dead and heal the sick. Although they see Jesus walk on water. This is perhaps the truest moment of revelation as to his complete nature. And remember that other phrase that Paul used. The fullness of the Godhead bodily dwells in my Lord. The fullness of the Godhead bodily dwells in my Lord. And this is a central thought. Uh, we're not... Uh, entirely locking ourselves down to a, a doctrinal uh, exposition of this but we must be doctrinally uh, right in the things that we, we think and say the fullness of the Godhead bodily dwells in my Lord and here it's as if the curtain is pulled back or the scales drop from their eyes or whatever terminology we want to use the fullness of the Godhead is seen in the transfiguration as well as the fullness of the perfected person who is uh, Jesus. And we have this uh, amazing moment. And it becomes yet more amazing. For a cloud 
overshadows them. I would go so far as to say that we need to interpret this cloud not just as a, a natural phenomenon that a breeze blew a cloud across, but that this is a cloud in the sense that the tent of the presence in the book of Exodus is shrouded in cloud. That cloud and smoke uh, is often interpreted uh, by Christian thinkers and teachers as representing God who is the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who is God, the third person of the Holy and Blessed Trinity, whom we worship and adore. And that this is a representation that we have uh, Jesus the Son uh, revealed in transfigured form uh, to the disciples with the law and the prophets and we have the Spirit present in the form of this uh, cloud or vapour or smoke or whatever. Uh, you know, as the cloud fills the temple in the book of Isaiah, you have this uh, cloud uh, enveloping the scene. This is the presence, the presence uh, of God Almighty with them. And then you have the voice of God. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. We have heard this voice at the baptism as we have had Father, Son and Holy Spirit present at the baptism of Jesus. We have Jesus come up out of the water. We have the Spirit descend upon him like a dove and we have the voice of the Father saying this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. We have heard this voice before. And we must pay attention in uh, the New Testament when the voice of heaven, the voice of the very God of very gods, the voice of God Almighty speaks out in affirmation of who Jesus is. If we are in any doubt as to who Jesus is, the gospel writers want us to know this truth that the Father has not only sent the Son to be the Saviour of the world, but the Father affirms his ministry. Affirms his ministry by the anointing of the Holy Spirit and affirms his ministry in the spoken declaration. And this again is like an investiture. This again is a proclamation. This is the one. And so we have this extraordinarily complete moment. There's a fullness in this. We have the law and the prophets. We have Moses and Elijah in consultation with the incarnate one, the everlasting Christ who is Jesus of Nazareth. We have Jesus of Nazareth, the perfect man, untrammeled and unsoiled by sin and disobedience. We have Jesus of Nazareth also revealed in his full sinless glory as the incarnate Son of God. We have the presence of God enveloping the whole scene, the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, and the voice of the Father speaks out and says to this band, this small little number this is my son and listen to him suddenly they looked around and saw no one with them anymore but only jesus extraordinary as they were coming down the mountain he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the son of man had risen from the dead this is what's known to uh, theologians and teachers of the faith as the messianic secret where Jesus on a number of occasions swears people to, uh, to secrecy. And uh, the reason for that is he does not want uh, populism. He does not want to be swept along on the shoulders of the crowd. He is not a rabble rouser. He is not one who says we are going to storm the building. He is not one who uh, says, I'm going to kick out the Romans. He is not one who says, take up a sword and follow me. He says, take up a cross and follow me. He is not one who comes uh, on a prancing white charger, followed by a band of yowling uh, zealots. 
He is one who comes on a donkey to the songs of people's praise. Even though he is man who is perfected in purity and in the service of God without sin. Even though he is very God himself, the Son proclaimed by the Father. Jesus doesn't want the populist. Jesus doesn't want politics. Jesus comes to bring the kingdom of God, which is a kingdom of mercy, a kingdom of grace, a kingdom of forgiveness, renewal, a kingdom of new life, new birth and joy, a kingdom that prefigures an everlasting kingdom. Jesus comes for these things and these things alone. So just as we're in the, the opening door of Lent that lies before us, it begins to turn our eyes towards Jerusalem. It begins to turn our eyes towards Good Friday. Those weeks that lie before us, we turn our eyes with our minds and our hearts and our souls brimming full of the wonder of the transfiguration of Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us give thanks to Almighty God for the completeness of all that he has given to us. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. O Lord, save the Queen and grant her government wisdom. Let your ministers be clothed with righteousness and let your servants shout for joy. O Lord, save your people and bless those whom you have chosen. Give peace in our time, O Lord, and let your glory be over all the earth. O God, may clean our hearts within us and renew us by your Holy Spirit. Almighty Father, whose Son was revealed in majesty before he suffered death upon the cross, give us grace to perceive his glory, that we may be strengthened to suffer with him and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you as eternal life and to serve you as perfect freedom, defend us in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your protection, may not fear the power of any adversaries, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and ever-living God, we give you thanks for bringing us safely to this day. Keep us from falling into sin or running into danger, and all things guide us to know and do your will, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we pray for the world, and we pray for the world at this time of intense suffering and difficulty. We give thanks to you, O Lord, that you abide with your people, that you walk with us, that you strengthen and comfort us. Comfort, O Lord, those who have lost loved ones. Bless them with your presence. May they know your peace in the inward parts. 
Heal the sick, O Lord, and raise up those who are fallen. We pray for your church in all the world. Forgive us our many sins and differences. Help us to dwell in unity before you to bring glory to your name and do that which is right and a blessing to the world. We pray for our church. We pray for John, our bishop and archbishop. We pray for all who serve under him throughout this diocese and all who work under his authority throughout this land. Bless your servant John this day, O Lord. Pray, O Lord, for all the clergy of this diocese and our lay preachers, parish readers. We pray for our select vestry members, honorary secretaries, honorary treasurers, church wardens, glee wardens, and all who hold official office within our parishes. We pray, O Lord, for them as we pray for everyone who ministers within our church and parish life. We pray, O Lord, that Soon we would be able to worship together. Again, we thank you for the gift of technology that brings us together. Even though it feels less than the norm, we thank you for this wonderful gift. We pray, O Lord, and we ask for your blessing upon our families and friends, all those whom we love and care for. And we dare even to pray for those who revile us and hate us as you have taught us to pray for our enemies. We pray for a swift resolution to our issues. We give thank, thanks to you for the promptness of the rollout of our vaccines. And we pray that very soon we would see real difference in our society. So we give ourselves into your care, O Lord. And thank you for all your goodness to us. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. To God, who by the power at work within us is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.